copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Buckman, the police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 150. Investigate a fire at 2124 Brandon Street. That's all. Rose and Cliff. Blooded listeners everywhere, thrilled to these true exploits of crime detection reenacted for you on Rio Grande's radio program, Calling All Cars. You are able to feel that you are a part of this relentless war on crime. Every time you hear a siren shriek, every time you hear a police motor roar, your heart beats a little faster. And while you cannot actually take part in police activities, you can experience every day at least a part of their thrills. You can use in your car exactly the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline that starts police cars so quickly. The same even burning gasoline that speeds them so swiftly through dense city traffic. The same powerful gasoline that lifts them so easily up steep hills without motor ping or shifting of gears. In other words, you can have police car performance. Just drive into any Rio Grande independent service station tomorrow and say, fill her up with cracked gasoline. Before night... You'll know why so many city and county police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment specify Rio Grande cracked gasoline in preference to any other brand. We guarantee you'll get as great a thrill out of using Rio Grande cracked gasoline as you get out of listening to calling all cars. Use 10 gallons of police car performance, and you will never again be satisfied with ordinary sluggish gasoline. Remember... Only Rio Grande gives you gasoline refined by the patented Sinclair cracking process. Try a tank full tomorrow at any independent service station displaying the big Rio Grande sign. Tonight, in commemoration of the National Fire Prevention Period, we have as guest in our studio Chief Ralph J. Scott of the Los Angeles Fire Department, who will speak to you. Chief Scott. Good evening. I should like to thank the sponsors of Calling All Cars, for their cooperation in helping to make this yearly function of the fire department the success it is sure to be. Through the medium of radio, it is possible for us to show you how terrible a thing fire really is when it is out of control, and particularly as in the case you will hear tonight, in which we are dealing with a pyromaniac, a person who sets fires because of some mental derangement. We have in this department a division whose entire duty it is to scourge and prevent such crimes. This is the Arson Bureau, in charge of Captain Paul Wolf. It is his job to try to prevent incendiary fires, and when such crimes are committed, to discover and prosecute the individual responsible. A hard job, inasmuch as these pyromaniacs, or firebugs as we call them, are usually as sane and as intelligent appearing as any normal human being. There is no mark of the killer stamped upon them. Often there is no past record to help identify them. They work completely alone, and yet they are potentially the most dangerous of criminals. We of the fire department need the help of the public. You people who are listening may at any time have the opportunity to help your fire department solve this type of crime. And now on with the story. o'clock in the evening, July 19th, 1928. Summer night school classes are in session at one of the larger Los Angeles high schools. Suddenly, one of the students, chancing to glance out of the window, notices a faint red glow and wisps of black smoke issuing from an upper window of the nearby administration building. Miss Merrill! Miss Merrill! Yes? What is it? Miss Merrill, look, it's on fire, the administration building. Fire? Why? Oh, oh, oh my goodness! How dreadful! It is on fire! Here, Miss Merrill, shall I turn on the fire alarm? It's right down at the end of the hall. Yes, James, and hurry. It's blazing something terrible. Okay, Miss Merrill. Let's see. Oh, break glass and pull lever. There.
firemen finally succeed in extinguishing the stubborn blaze, but not until it's destroyed the scenery dock and part of the stage of the school auditorium, with a property loss amounting to $8,000. The cause of the fire is a mystery. It appears to be more than an accident, and on the following day, July 20th, 1928, Captain Paul Wolf of the Los Angeles Arson Bureau receives a telephone call from Fire Chief Bert Enos, telling him to go to the school and make a complete investigation. Captain Wolf hurries to the scene of the previous night's fire, but a thorough inspection of the charred building fails to disclose a single piece of material evidence that the fire was of incendiary origin. However, while questioning one of the witnesses who were at the scene of the fire, he unearthed a startling bit of information. Yes, Captain, I saw the fire last night. I had a class in English history. My classroom's right across from the administration building. Tell me, do they think this fire was started by whoever set all those other fires here? Yeah. Other fires? Why, what other fires? There was a fire in the gym last month, and the one in... Well, as a matter of fact, I don't really know. I shouldn't have... Go ahead, Mr. Pritchard. Let's have it. Well, I shouldn't have said anything. I really don't know much about yes, it. Yes, but you do know that there were other fires. You said so. Now, what about them? I'm sorry, Captain Wolf. I, I can't tell you anything further. Mr. Reynolds of the Board of Education knows about the fires and can undoubtedly give you the information you wish. I suggest you talk to him. I know nothing more about it. Realizing that something is very much wrong at the school, Captain Wolf makes an appointment to see Mr. Reynolds, superintendent of maintenance of the Board of Education, at the latter's office. Well, yes, Captain Wolf, there have been other fires at the school. As a matter of fact, during the past 18 months, there have been eight fires, three very bad ones. Last night's, well, was the most serious yet. Well, good heavens, man, why in the world wasn't the fire department called and the arson squad notified? Why do you realize, Mr. Oh, Reynolds, yes, of course, that... Captain Wolf, of course, but that's just the point. We're in a terrible position. You see, there have been threatening notes, warning that the school would be bombed if we notified the police or other authorities of the disturbances. Yeah, I can well appreciate your position, Mr. Reynolds. That's a tough spot to be in. But you can't just let a thing like this go on without making some attempt to check it. Oh, no, of course not, Captain. While we've tried to keep the whole thing quiet, at the same time, we've been carrying on a private investigation into the matter with absolutely no results. Fires have been started under our very noses and all sorts of acts of vandalism perpetrated and the threatening notes continue. It's apparently the work of some secret terrorist organization within the student body. But as to whom it is, we haven't the slightest idea. And now, what makes you think it's an organization within the student body? Well, in the first place, the signature on the notes. They're all signed, Holy 21 Society. The contents of many of the notes demanding certain changes in faculty personnel and management of the school and the subsequent depredation against school property. Now, according to Dr. Frederick's report, oh, Dr. Frederick's the school principal, of course, the notes started appearing about uh, 18 months ago. The majority demanded all manner of changes in the school and threats of violence if the demands were not carried out or if the police were notified. Yeah, that sounds pretty serious, all right. Yes, I'm afraid it is. At the same time, all sorts of acts of vandalism began to occur in the school. Washrooms were flooded, desks torn up, and fires mysteriously started in various sections of the school. Meanwhile, those infernal notes keep appearing in every conceivable place, and the destruction of school property continues. The faculty is living under a virtual reign of terror out there. I'd like to take a look at some of the notes, Mr. Reynolds. Have you got them? Well, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't, Captain Wolf. I believe Dr. Fredericks, the principal, has most of them. Dr. Fredericks, sir? Yes. Then he's the man I want to talk to next. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. From Dr. Fredericks, Captain Wolf receives affirmation of all Reynolds has told him. Takes the note to his office. A careful examination of the hundred or more threatening missives, however, yields not a single meager clue as to the possible identity of the writers. But the fact that the notes are written in three distinctly different handwritings lends support to the theory that more than one person is behind the sinister disturbances. The following day, Captain Wolf returns to the office of the principal, Dr. Fredericks. Now tell me, Dr. Fredericks, how many students have you in the school? The 3,200, Captain Wolf. Can you get me samples of their handwriting? All of them? Yes, Dr. Fredericks, every single one of them. Well, it'll be a little difficult. It may take a little time, but I guess I can manage it. Good, and when you get them, send them all to my office, if you please. And, uh, yes, these square sheets of scratch paper that the threatening notes are written on. Is this regular school scratch paper? Why, no, Captain Wolf, it isn't. I supposed it was at first, but I found it doesn't match up with any we use here. Hmm, that's odd. 
I'll have to make a check on that. Uh, yes? Who is it? It's Price, sir, the janitor. Uh, pardon me, Captain Wolf. Come in, Price. <laughs> what is it? I'm very busy right now. You'd better... Excuse me, Dr. Frederick, but I think you ought to know. It may have some bearing on the fire the other night. Yeah, let him come in. Uh, come in, Price. Now, what is it? Well, I've been waiting for you to come in, sir. I didn't know you were here until a few minutes ago. I thought you ought to know right away, sir. It's about last night. At about 9 o'clock, I was on my way to my room. I'd been down to the corner to eat. Well, as I came around the corner of the chemistry building, I saw a couple of figures drop to the ground from one of the windows. They saw me just as I saw them, and they beat it. I chased them and hollered for them to stop, but they got away. Did you see what they looked like? Uh, Price, this is Captain Wolf. Uh, he's investigating the fire. I'm glad to know you, Captain Wolf. Why, yes. They were young fellows. Uh, one was a colored boy, the other white. The colored boy, well, he looked about like most colored boys. The white boy had dark hair and sort of slant eyes. Uh, you didn't recognize either of these boys as students here, did you? Why, no, sir. Does that mean that they couldn't be students here? Do you know all the students by sight? Oh, no, sir, I don't. You see, there are over 3,000. I know a lot of them by sight, but nowhere near all of them. Well, would you recognize these boys if you saw them again? I think so. At least the white boy. I might not recognize the colored boy. But the other I think I'd know. Good. Now, I may need your help. Are you here every day? I'm here all the time, just about. I have a room in the basement in the north end of the building. You see, I'm the janitor here. I've been kept on as caretaker and watchman for the summer. And maybe I can help you some in your investigation, Captain Wolf. I've been sort of working on the case on my own hook. I haven't run down anything definite as yet, but I may at any time. If I do, I'll get right in touch with you. Well, that's fine, Price, and I won't hesitate to call on you if I need you. Armed with this meager bit of information, Wolf returns to his office, sets the machinery of the arson bureau into motion. In rapid succession, he uncovers the following bits of information. Samples of school paper, handwritings of each of the 3,200 students enrolled at school, fail to show any similarity with any of the mysterious Holy 21 notes. Fingerprint samples of all 40 members of the faculty board, after being carefully checked by the Department of Identification, fail to bring to light any indications that might serve to point a suspicious finger in that direction. Yes, sir, I discovered the first fire. No, sir, I didn't call the apparatus. I didn't think it was necessary at the time to bother the fire department. Well, of course, I realize my mistake now, sir. Every attempt to locate samples of the scratch paper upon which the notes are written ends in failure. Each school, stationery store, paper house in Los Angeles County is searched, but the answer remains the same. And it is this that finally leads Captain Wolf and an assistant to make a bold move. I don't make any sense of this journey, Paul. What are you going to gain by prying into the cellars of this school? Looking for boogeymen? No, not boogeymen. Swill buckets. Swill buckets? Exactly. You know what they are, the things you throw swill into? Sure, I know what they are, all right. But would you mind telling me what swill buckets have got to do with this particular case? And it'll be easier to show you. Here's the spot now. See, now, three nice big cans just loaded with refuse. Now we're going to play sabotage. What? Come on, now, give me a hand. Yeah. <coughs> All that Foley's got into you, Paul. You're making an awful mess. Sure, that's the main idea. Come on, give me a hand with this other one. Here, there we go. Over on the side, and out comes the gun. You know, I've always wondered what made these birds like to bust things up. Now I'm beginning to understand. Hey, bust it up. Here we are. I hope you're happy. Yeah. Certainly made a lovely sight out of this place. Now what do we do? Set fire to it? Burn the place down? Well, I don't blame you for being a little skeptical, Art, but it's really on the up and up. I think you'll understand more clearly in a couple of minutes. Come on. <laughs> Leaving the filth-smeared north cellar, Wolf, closely followed by the bewildered aide, proceeds to Janitor Price's quarters. Finds him in. Well, I'm sorry to bother you, Price, but I'm afraid our friends have been at work again down in the north cellar. How's that, sir? Well, I just came from there. The swill buckets are all knocked about, and everything is dumped all over the floor. It's not a pretty sight. The swill buckets? Yeah, the swill buckets. Anything unusual in that? Seems to me it's the sort of thing that's been happening around here lately. Oh, why, yes. Of course, Captain. It, it was just that I was a bit surprised, I well, guess. You'd better get down there and clean it up before it begins to smell. The sanitation board would like nothing better than to find something like that in the pool, you know. Oh, yes, of course. I'll go down immediately. 
If you gentlemen will excuse me. Right, of course. Well, what do we do now? Well, we wait here until Mr. Price gets busy with that swill down there, and then we're going through his room. What? You heard me. We're going through his room with a fine tooth comb. I don't just know what to look for, but for some reason or other, I've got a niche to see it. Come on. <laughs> of Janitor Price's room uncovers very little at first, but Wolf, skilled in the art of investigating without leaving telltale traces, leaves nothing unturned. And at last, in the bottom drawer of Price's dresser, he finds the first real clue. Several pieces of scratch paper identical with that of the notes. Convinced that Price is the guilty man, but faced with the problem of proving it not only to himself but to the district attorney's office, Wolf tries various methods of approach. He sets a stake out of the school in which he himself plays one of the watchers. But night after night, as he lies in bushes watching the suspect, nothing happens. Yet in the morning, inevitably some further act of sabotage has occurred within the school. And then one day, as he sits in his office examining the meager facts at hand, he receives a call from Fire Chief Eno, instructing him to investigate an accident between a piece of fire apparatus and a delivery truck at an address on Brandon Street. At the scene of the accident, Wolf makes a routine investigation, finds the driver of the grocery truck to have been at fault, tells his driver to take him back to the office. And as the car speeds on to its destination, his mood is not of the pleasant. Yeah, all the way out to this forsaken spot to do something that anyone in the department could do instead. Say, what am I? Assistant bottle washer of the force or something? Well, maybe the chief wanted you to come out because he knew you do the job right, Captain Wolf. Hey, don't try to solve something. I've been in this department long enough to recognize it when I hear it, and it won't help. That's it. Mean, I wasn't meaning to. Yeah, I know. Let me see that you don't do it. Say, hey, Eddie. Isn't that the school over there? Yes, sir. You know, I've got half a mind to do something drastic at this point. I'm just about sore enough to get away with it. What's that, Captain? Say, pull up at the first fire block, you see, will you, Eddie? Sure thing. There's one here in the corner. Hey, hand me that fire phone out of the pocket. Yes, sir. Here you are. Right. I'll be back in a minute. Fire department. This is Captain Wolf. Let me talk to Chief Enos, will you? Right away, Captain. You know, I have a feeling Enos isn't going to like this. But I know how to take care of all that. Hello, Paul. What's up? Hey, listen, Chief. I'm out here by the school, and I'm going to bring Price in. What's that? I said I'm going to bring Price in for questioning. Oh, listen, Paul. You're taking a terrible chance. You haven't anything on him. If you do this and we can't crack him, you'll be wise. And we're whipped. Huh? I can't hear you very well, Chief. But I'll be in soon, and then you can tell me. I'm telling you not to do it. Can you hear me? Don't do it. Okay, Chief, I hear you. That's fine. I'll have him in there in a jiffy. Goodbye. How'd you make out? Oh, fine. Just fine. The Chief was delighted. And now drive me over to that school and don't waste any time. <laughs> At the school, Wolf finds Janitor Price busy at his duties, explaining that there are a few points that he would like cleared up, but giving no clue that he suspects Price, Wolf drives him to his office, offers him a chair and a cigarette. Then, in a conversational tone of voice, he carefully baits his suspect. You know, Price, you're an amazing sort of a fellow. Well, thanks, Captain Wolf, but I don't quite understand what you mean. Well, here you are, a janitor, and working at a school in a menial sort of a job, and yet it's easy enough to see that you're an intelligent man. You've had an education. Circumstances and... sometimes alter one's plans, Captain Wolf. Sure, I, I guess they do. But you're not a very good janitor, are you, Price? I feel that I am. Yet you let all these things happen right under your nose, and you don't stop them. How do you explain that if you're such a good janitor? You know as well as I do, Captain Wolf, that those things are unexplainable. No, you're wrong there. I know, but not as well as you do. Isn't that right, Price? I, I don't see where all this is leading to. Oh, yes, you do. Only too well. Now, look here, Price. Why don't you stop all this fooling around and settle down and tell me the truth about this mess? Are you insinuating that I know who's doing all this? More than that, Price. I'm saying that you're doing it. And I've got certain facts to prove my statement. Why, this is mad. You're mad. The whole idea is mad. Mad, huh? You seem to like that word, Price. Maybe it has some bearing on all this. What do you mean? Don't you have moments when you go a little mad yourself? How do you know? Who, who have you been talking to? I know. 
I know that man on the car, that man that knew me. Yeah, sure, that's the one, Price. That's the one. Now, come on, take it easy. Spill it. All right. All right, Captain Will. I'll do my best. There are some things I'm not just clear on, but I'll do my best. Say, that's fine. Now, just tell me the whole story and everything will be all right. Well, well, I have headache. Bad headache. Had them for a long time. Ever since that day in Brookline. Yeah, well, tell me about that day, Price. What happened? It was before they sent me to the Westboro Asylum. I was working as a linesman for a power company. One day in the rain, I was up repairing a transformer, working on a line outside the second story of the powerhouse. Mac was down below on the ground. How's she going, friend? Okay, Mac. Won't be long now. I uh, hope not. I'm getting water long. Man, sounds like that thunder's getting a lot closer, eh? Hey, did you see that flash of lightning? Yeah, plenty close, too. Oh! Oh, good Lord, it hit him. He knocked him down like a fly. Hey, give me a hand here, somebody. Give me a hand. Knocked to the ground when the lightning struck the powerhouse. Fractured my skull. At least that's what they thought, but I guess my head was damaged more than that. After I got out of the hospital, I began to have spells. I'd kind of wander around. Then when I'd come to, I'd usually be near some burning house or barn. You know, Captain Wolf, I don't know myself if I set those fires to the barns and things back there. I'm not sure at all. Well, it's more than likely that you did, Price. Go on. Well, they finally picked me up and stuck me in the asylum. I was there a year when on Christmas Eve, I was trimming a Christmas tree. And I fell off a ladder. Well, you had another fall, huh? Yes, landed on my head again. But apparently the fall removed a blood clot that had been pressing on my brain and restored my sanity. They decided I was all right and released me. What did you do then? Came to California. Everything was smooth sailing for quite a while. I felt fine. Never had any more dizzy spells or anything. Then one day, when I was riding in the streetcar, I felt as though someone was looking at me. I looked up and recognized a man I used to know back at the Westboro Asylum. He was staring at me, and his eyes seemed to get bigger and bigger and closer to me until they were almost touching me. Those huge, big eyes. I got dizzy and my head hurt. I got off the streetcar at the next corner feeling pretty badly. Well, after that, I began getting terrible headaches again. About that time, I got the janitor job at the school. The spells and headaches kept getting worse. Then one night, while I was lying in bed in my room in the basement with my head feeling like it was going to burst, I thought I heard a voice. Frederick Price. Frederick Price, my son. Who is it? Who are you? Who are you? It is I, your father, Moloch, the god of fire and flame. Mighty Moloch. God of fire. Do you know me, my son? Don't you know your father, Moloch? God of fire? Yes. Yes, I know you, father. I know you. There is work to do, my son. Work to do. Work. Work. Yes, father. Yes, I know. Work to do. Work. You must burn. Destroy. Yes. Burn. Yes. Destroy. Yes. Burn. I guess I must have gotten out of bed and gone out and started a fire, Captain Wolf, because I suddenly came to and found myself in one of the upper halls of the school near a flaming coat closet. I put it out myself and reported it to the head janitor next morning. It's been like that ever since. Oh, I guess I'm crazy, Captain Wolf, but I swear I can't help it. I can't stop when I hear that voice. I want you to lock me up somewhere where I can't do any more damage. That's the only thing to do with me. Maybe sometime you'll kill me. But for now, lock me up. Put me away. Please put me away. Pleasure now in presenting Judge Thomas C. Gould of the Superior Court, Los Angeles County. Judge Gould. 
Frederick Price was bound over to the Superior Court of Los Angeles County and his trial there upon the charge of arson followed. It was evident at all times that the man was suffering from some mental disease which turned him at moments into a true pyromaniac, causing him to set fires of which he had no knowledge later. This court found him not guilty by reason of insanity and sent him to the state insane asylum at Patton where he spent some time. Later, at the request of a large organization of which he was a member, he was released to be transferred to a private sanitarium in the East, where he is now confined. Thank you, Judge Gould. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to bring pleasure to some boy or girl of your acquaintance without extra cost or inconvenience to yourself? Then listen to this. Every youngster who follows this program, and there are thousands of them, longs to be a detective, a policeman, a G-man. Rio Grande has brought reality to this dream for thousands of boys and girls by giving junior G-man and detective outfits absolutely free. You could make this dream come true for your boy or girl just by a little cooperation. Drive to your nearest Rio Grande independent service station for your next tank full of gasoline. Ask for a free copy of Calling All Cars News. Besides interesting detective and movie news, it tells all about police badges, G-man, flash guns, Sam Brown belts, and other gifts that will delight the heart of any youngster. You could get 14 different gifts just by using a few gallons of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. If you happen to be the youngster, pass this information on to the proper party. Your very first tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline will show you why police and fire departments of Los Angeles, Oakland, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties buy it in preference to any other brand. Your Rio Grande independent dealer will also recommend Sinclair Motor Oil as enthusiastically as he endorses Rio Grande cracked gasoline. He knows Sinclair Oil will stand up under the most grueling use. In fact, he guarantees it to stand up. Sinclair motor oils are recommended by independent dealers from coast to coast. Sinclair Eyes for safety. Calling all cars, attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 150. Suspects in this case are now in custody. And that's all. Rolls and quits. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night.